Okay, thank you very much for being here now. This is a panel discussion with a critical question. What to do, what do the cross-cutting themes on the social determinants of health mean for health equity in the era of sustainable development? I'm gonna be conducting this, uh, this panel discussion and I have the honor to be joined by Dr. Pablo Bus, Dr. Nila Heredia, Ms. Tracy Robinson, Dr. Maria Paula Romo, and Dr. David Satcher. Uh, it's going to be a question and answer uh, modality, and uh, I'll be placing some questions to the panelists. They will have between eight and 10 minutes, please no more than 10 minutes, so that we can have a, a discussion with the, with the participants. Uh, and I'm gonna pose some key questions uh, so that they can express their feeling and their ideas and their orientation in that regard. At the end, we will have some discussion uh, in which I uh, invite all of you to participate actively. I'm gonna be doing this in Spanish and English, so I invite you also to have ready your, your uh, translation, which is uh, available to all of you, and uh, so that you don't miss any of the important things uh, that are gonna be presented here today. El, and I'm switching to Spanish now. The, uh, the purpose of this meeting is to emphasize the importance of the, the cross-cutting themes and the social determinants of health within the context of sustainable development. Specifically, the discussion should point out the objectives, um, the important objectives of this region for the development of this committee and for this commission and for their working uh, for the next two years. I will begin by asking a question to Dr. Paolo Luz that it's important to point out for me because his experience and the experience that you had in in the uh, social um, determinants in Brazil as far as equity and, and social justice that are seen in different ways in the political arena and discourse and especially at the level of the United Nations or international fora. The ob objectives of the sustainable development or development of the millennium well, was called by equity and now these, the objectives are not to leave every, anyone behind. And we always put slogans that uh, make us uh, think or act. But how can we go from the slogan to practice to, to the operative and to have an important impact on what we are doing? What do we have to do to lose this uh, blindness to equity and how far can we be politically correct but at the same time have a strategic focus to commit ourselves to reach what could possibly have as an objective by this commission very specifically but also quantifiable in order to close the gaps and close the gradients of equity. How does justice or, or social equity with these gaps can be reduced? And how can this commission contribute to this regard? How do the ministries in the social sector and of course through, um, in the health sector how can we imp they impact these peoples from the equity point of view? Thank you. Francisco, I will continue with my, I'm, I'm still not well health-wise. I will make an effort to, for you to understand me. First of all, I believe 
that the issue of social justice and equity is present in all of our societies in Latin America, in Canada, and the United States, in all of the countries of the Americas, the discourse of social justice and equity is present in our countries. It is present in the civil society, it is present among the governments, the, uh, the leaders, the congresses, our, uh, that is to say among our legislators. When I say Congress, I mean senators and congressmen. The issue is present in different segments of society and government with NGOs. And there's probably no one, no one that can say no to a more just society and more equitable. The problem is how do we go from the concept to practice of social justice and equity? I believe that we are living in a very interesting period and it's the, the transposition of the 2030 agenda and the objectives of the sustainable development to the countries. We have already done it at the level of the UN in New York the signing of the commitment of the countries, of all the countries, of the Americas and the world in general, but now we're talking about the Americas, all of the countries of the Americas signed the commitment with the Sustainable Development Objectives. And the, these SDGs include very clearly, very deep, the issue of equity. Equity took the global agenda in such a way that it was very clear, just as in the national societies are in all of our countries. All of our countries formulate and others implement and others not national development plans. I believe it's very important to point out that at the global level, the signature of the agenda and sustainable development, and inside the countries, all of us do a study that shows that all of the countries of the Americas have national plans, development plans, including the issue of health. So. I believe it's a very important time to verify what, what are these plans. We are working deeply uh, trying to learn the development national plan of our country and to see how, uh, how health is part of this political decision, which is, was proposed by the government and approved by the, passed by the national government. It is impressive in the preliminary studies that we've made that the presence of health in the national development plan of our country is very much like the proposal that was made in the 2030 agenda amongst the sustainable development um, goals of the UN. But the difference is that when we see the SDG health, we have to make sure that it's not just a word. It's not just to propose, but we have to make sure that health and well-being, health and well-being for all, at all ages, diplomatically, politically, this is a development goal that is very strong. When we see how this, uh, this morning, in uh, the great um, presentation by Michael, he showed the possibility of connecting 
the development, the uh, SDGs and others, the health with health. We are looking for this ourselves also in Brazil. How could to connect the results of the other, the one to six objectives of the SDGs with the third goal, which is the one that refers to health. And to do this, that is, to implement this adequately, we would have the possibility of social justice. But for this will occur de facto, we have to have a strong movement of civil society so that civil society can get from the Congress and government the plan, the development plans and the 2030 agenda and the SDGs and we have it transferred to the countries. Social, yeah, uh, civil society is also, is there, thus very important. Number two, we have to think that there are new government forms or governance and planning have to be implemented in order to have a sustainable development that is integral and equitable. This is the task that is very important, and I believe that this commission has a role, to, a very important role to play, that on the one hand would be the health strategy in all policies. This decision was made by the health ministers of the member states of this organization. In 2014, or 13, I'm not sure, a decision was made at the minister level. It, it is to implement health in all of the policies because this is a way of guaranteeing the social determinants. Because if we implement the other uh, um, goals of uh, development, uh, sustainable development, we are determining the health. So to, in order to do this, I think it is very important for this commission to have as a very important focus in identifying new ways of governance capable of, along with other sectors, to face the social determinants of health. One of the strategies is the issue of health in all policies. In my opinion, this is one of the most important strategies, and Francisco mm, made mention, we had one of your documents that um, emphasized this. So the world sees our region with uh, certain eyes. They think, well, there's something new is happening there. But we don't have to avoid the imperialism in health, that is, health in all policies, not to say that we are the most important thing at all, but no, but we just have to include the idea because health is important for carrying out the other SDGs. So there is a come and go or a mutual assistance in order to carry out development and development can influence and result in better health in the region for each one of our countries. So I think that this is our <coughs> duty, our function in this commission to find people of other sectors that can join uh, the those uh, uh, policy makers and governments and working in health and find new ways of governance, planning, joint planning, and in my opinion, 
And I, I proposed to do in the commission, to be the focus in the commission for this vision or for this, so that we can carry forward this perspective. Today I was ta uh, having a cup of coffee and I'm always uh, thinking this, um, we're always eating. And so and then I wrote something, a common thing. There's, it's a, the one of the processes of this the commission is to work with government, governance, policies, and planning in order to for, uh, for sustainable development, colon, oh, for a sustainable, for integral and a comprehensive and uh, sustainable development, uh, colon, uh, these are important for health. This is, would be a proposal so that we can say we're going to social justice and equity in countries that are extremely uh, um, unequal there, and, uh, with the other countries, with public policies, without ignoring the market, but we don't say that the market per se would be able to implement this issue of health or only the social movements. This happens with government actions that are committed with equitable integral development, including health and building these bridges. So when you ask me, it's not only the social ministries, but also the you know, economic or financial ones. Number one, two, social justice necessarily goes through fiscal justice. Fiscal justice, the richest have to pay more. And in our countries, this does not happen. Who pays the, the, uh, who, uh, for the governments or development are the workers. And this has to change. Inheritances of large fortunes, the issue of circulation of capital is part of fiscal justice. And this commission cannot, mm, be blind to such large evidence also. If, for example, in the terms of, of um, circulation, international circulation of capital, trillions of dollars circulate every night, and the, the tax is ignored by the international community. Well, these are my first words, and thank you for listening to me, and, and we hope that this commission will work in this path of governance, government, and planning. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. I'm glad you're not feeling well and your throat is bothering you because then, we, or else we wouldn't be able to stop you. As usual. Specifically, what actions can we implement in countries through the minist health ministries so as to get equity and gender within the institutions themselves and also to make sure that the health services are sensitive to the um, issue of gender. Thank you. I couldn't say anything without uh, acknowledging the foundation laid by Paolo. Uh, uh, gender equity is part of social determinants and they complement and complicate and make more complex this issue of inequity. And inequity as a consequence of the elements that determine the health of individuals. And in this case, women as part of that, s of that set of people. So it can't be marginalized from the whole discussion and what uh, Paolo raised. But there is, however, another issue that does come to light very strikingly, and that is the issue of gender. <coughs> In the health sphere, since this is not isolated from the other elements, including education, housing, etc., when we talk about gender and health, uh, uh, Oh, well, it, I have to be honest, it bothers me to talk about gender as a phenomenon. 
removed from the whole set of the population or the population as a whole. However, we're talking about unique, aspect, unique aspects <clears throat> that women face in terms of health. I would like to uh, divide this into two parts. The first is that in the health sphere, there are two parts. Who are the servants and who are <coughs> the customers or the recipients? I think that we need to always include in this an analysis and research regarding the feminization of professions. We have to look at the medical sphere, which is no longer a primarily male discipline. <coughs> Schools of medicine are graduating many women, and uh, these human resources are available uh, to be hired. I don't know whether any country uh, departs from this, but in most of our countries, particularly in Latin America, when there is so much inequality, uh, there is no specific line of work of human resources management. And they think it's the same to send a woman to a rural area as it is to send a man. And women, as they are professionals, are also exposed to a lot of pressure, aggression, and violence on the part of the population. So it is one thing to be a female physician in a rural area alone, and it's another thing to be a man alone in such a place where a man can defend himself. So that is an important issue that needs to be incorporated into our examination of how we can provide good health services, good health care, while well, we see that the central element, the central subject of medical activity is a human resource. And if this human resource <coughs> is not properly managed, then he or she is not properly placed, then the service is not going to uh, be good. So I think that that is a window of opportunity for research on the feminization of the professions and also the diversification of professions within the health sphere. Perhaps it was very clear we had a, a physician, a nurse, and an auxiliary nurse. Now there is a wide range of professions, and I reiterate that there has been a feminization of these professions. Therefore, <coughs> we need to conduct a diagnosis and make a proposal for human resource management because human resources are the crux of uh, services within the health sector. So that's one issue. The second one is the issue of the rights of individuals and women viewed as comprehensive uh, subjects. Women are not just reproduction machines, rather they are whole persons. So it does not suffice to prepare sexual and reproductive health programs <coughs> and just have a program for um, uh, pre uh, prenatal and uh, birth uh, care and postpartum care, women are full human beings. So the ministries of health in particular must develop programs to look at this. We see in the hemisphere an increase in gender-based violence, for example, and feminicide has increased. And I don't know it's just because it's getting reported more or whether there is actually an increase in femicide. But it is apparent that in our countries it is going up. So while women have been incorporated into the workplace more and their rights are recognized, there has been an increase in violence against women's, women. Therefore, uh, well, I'm talking about the situation in some of our countries. And even in the diagnoses that are conducted, there is no explanation of why well, somebody might have a bruise or a, 
a hematoma. You might say, w w people don't ask uh, why a woman has these injuries and bruises. And so there are indicators within each ministry, and they need to address uh, the situation more comprehensively. And I'd like to get on to the next issue. Gender in no way can be separated from children's issues. Uh, no matter how much there are shared responsibilities between mother and father in a household, children generally are under the care of the woman. So this is, there's such a tremendous symbiosis that we can't look at women in isolation from their children and violence against children. So I believe that the ministries need to have a way to do a broader analysis and more research and make more visible the increase in gender-based violence. We need to look at how ministries incorporate indicators to make this visible. and. <coughs> So the ministries of health should not take this on alone. There needs to be coordination with other ministries uh, that need to address this situation, perhaps the Ministry of Justice and other branches of government. So I would just stop there as, my, as far as my initial remarks on this topic. Thank you very much, Ms. Heredia. And uh, I'm going to ask Ms. Tracy Robinson. Voy a pasar a the body of evidence shows that the conditions of daily life, inequities in power, money, and resources are largely responsible for health and for inequities in health. In your opinion, how do universal and regional human rights norms and standards interact with these interrelated inequalities, and how can the conceptual and legal framework of human rights contribute to improve health and reduce inequalities in health across the region of the Americas? Please. Thank you very much, Assistant Director. Um, in addition to saying it's a privilege to be here, I also want to recognize the August audience, which includes country representatives, PAHO staff, and my fellow commissioners. And I also see in the audience Under Secretary of the OAS for Human Rights, and I'm pleased that she's also here today. Um, I wanted to begin by saying that. Uh, a range of human rights instruments actually recognize the conditions of daily life and inequalities that are social determinants as violations of human rights, particularly economic, social, and cultural rights. And notably for us in the Americas, these include regional and inter-American instruments, uh, the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man, the American Convention, um, and particularly the San Salvador Protocol. If you take the American Declaration, um, which has the distinction of being an instrument which is now nearly 70 years old and preceded the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, albeit limited it very plainly over se almost 70 years ago, identifies social determinants as essential to conceptualizing a human rights to health. So Article 11 says every person has the right to the preservation of his or her health through sanitary and social measures relating to food, clothing, housing, and medical care to the extent permitted by public and community resources. At the international level, there's obviously the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, among others, which establish the human right to the highest attainable standard of health. And the Committee on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights has made it very clear that this includes what they call the underlying determinants of health. A very notable feature of the inter-American system has been how it articulates the interdependence and indivisibility of human rights, particularly the social, economic, social, and cultural ones, and what we would call civil and political. The Inter-American Court on a number of occasions has said that the right to life, which is protected in Article 4 of the American Convention, protects, and I'm quoting the court, the right to have access to the conditions which guarantee a decent life. And that includes the adoption of positive measures that prevent the violation of this right to life. The court has also said that states 
in the Americas have a duty to ensure that persons have a right to a dignified life, what they call vida digna. And articulating this indivisibility of human rights as well as the relationship between human rights and social determinants of health in a case which is relatively well known in the region, uh, Yake Aksa indigenous community, the court said special detriment to the right to health um, and closely tied to this detriment to the right to food and access to clean water have a major impact on the right to a decent existence and basic conditions to exercise other human rights, such as the right to education or the right to cultural identity. So I've started with this obvious that many of the social determinants are already human rights obligations to remind us that while it is critical to secure contemporary agendas, notably um, the current agenda to sustainable development, the 2030 agenda, and that these are clearly aligned with securing health equity and ending inequalities, we should not sidestep human rights as a foundational normative framework with concrete standards and a system of accountability in our quest for global social justice. So let me take the question, how do the legal and conceptual frameworks for human rights actually support the reduction in health inequalities? But firstly, at the conceptual level, human rights, which are interdependent and indivisible, which recognize the intersection of axes of disadvantage and discrimination, are an integrated approach to understanding health inequalities, one that needs further development, but is an integrated approach to begin with. Secondly, despite articulating what are abstract and universal notions of justice, human rights as a system of law does establish the standard by which you measure the respect for the realization and the fulfillment of the articulated human rights, including concepts like, of course, progressive realization in relation to economic, social, and cultural rights. The third thing I would say in defense of the value of human rights to this project is that the human rights system, even as imperfect as it is, is a framework of accountability. This is a point which I heard Javier Vasquez make yesterday from PAHO. And lack of accountability is at the crux of persistent inequity and inequalities and is the concern I've heard many of my fellow commissioners articulate and consistently make over the last day. How do we ensure that what needs to be done is now done? Rights frameworks aren't necessarily capable of addressing all forms and dimensions of global injustice. And in as much as I see frameworks um, relating to human rights as strengthening analysis of social determinants and inequity, I think the converse is true. I think the analysis of health and equity actually offer a call to human rights discourse to develop more substantive and robust notions of equality, to deepen with urgency the way in which human rights understands poverty and class inequalities, and how they go to the heart of freedom, justice, and dignity, which are the key constituents of human rights. And equally, human rights cannot shy away from the need for structural reform of the global economic order or its historical origins, which in this region are colonialism and slavery. This decade, which is de dedicated to people of African descent, their recognition, justice, and development must also be a pivotal time for reflection, truth, and progress in relation to people of African descent. So even though I accept we may have limitations, there are ways of strengthening human rights analysis, we will lose something in achieving a progressive agenda, making possible a progressive agenda in relation to health, if we ignore the force of a system of rights holders, duty bearers with mechanisms for redress. For those who are dispossessed, who are ignored, who are invisible, who are disadvantaged, historically rights have been, to use the language of an African-American legal scholar, Patricia Williams, rights have been islands of empowerment. This was a very striking insight for me in my time as a member of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights as I traveled the Americas. Human rights frameworks of accountability 
are also premised on participation by an empowerment of those most affected who have the ability to enforce legal entitlements. That participation, as many experts point out, demand as preconditions other human rights entitlements, such as freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and access to information. That system of accountability at the national, regional, and international levels uh, has also called states to account, and Latin American countries have seen a vibrant litigation practice around the right to health, which should be instructive for us. Now, you may trust a lawyer to make the courtroom the center of everything, but I'm not really suggesting that the court is the center, either of human rights or certainly not of life. And judges will face difficulties in resolving difficult policy questions relating um, to social determinants of health and also granting remedies which are effective in, uh, in addressing the underlying structural reasons for inequalities. But they are mandated to do so by constitutional and other human rights frameworks and have in a number of cases done so with good effect, strengthening accountability in ways that have mattered to women, men, and children in the Americas. So accountability matters in the Americas whether it's the killing of, by the police of unarmed black men in, the, in America, whether it is in Latin America disappearances, ongoing conflict, the decimation of indigenous territory by development projects, whether it is endemic uh, citizen insecurity in the Caribbean, or in Central America, the numerous trans women who said to me, we will not live be, be, above the age of 40, we don't think we will see the age of 40 because of the conditions of our life. Whether it is the persistent inequalities in health in this hemisphere, the people of the Americas are sick and tired of impunity. Accountabil accountability matters extraordinarily in this region. And so to end, my sense is that many who are committed to development, some to health, are wary of human rights or their worry that some dimensions of human rights discourse polarize rather than unify commitment and action for change. Or some argue that human rights has to date produced some disappointing results. I'm not avoiding that discussion. I think we can have meaningful engagement around those concerns, but I see no ethical way forward in addressing equity and healthy inequalities in the Americas without treating those first words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as the underpinning of this project. And those words are, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, peace, and peace in our world today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sir Robinson. <laughs> Let me switch now to Spanish again. Uh, Dr. Maria Paula Romo. What do you think the main barriers are preventing young women in the region uh, from enjoying their sexual and reproductive rights? What impact do these health, these barriers on health, well-being, and uh, equality have? And what can states do to eliminate these barriers in inequities and the problems that they cause? Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Assistant Director, I would like to answer that directly. And in order to do so, I would like to offer data on a specific case that I'm very familiar with in my country, which is not included in the report being prepared uh, uh, with the review, but a lot of this data may be applicable to other countries in the region. In Ecuador, this is how the general government budget has evolved over the last decade. The budget has grown by leaps and bounds. It's almost increased fivefold. During that same time period, we see the government's in spending on health, and that has also increased 
significantly and also the number of people included in the social protection system, the social security system. We have three women chairing the legislature for the first time in Ecuador. We have not only a, a female speaker of the House, but also two uh, female vice chairs. And we also have made progress in terms of mor uh, maternal mortality. In 2005, from two th then to 2014, we've made um, uh, progress almost of almost 10 points in this in terms of teen pregnancy, the rate per 1,000 adolescents uh, compared to our close neighbors in the region, we say that we have 76 teen pregnancies for every 1,000 uh, adolescent population, while Colombia and Peru have 52 or 50, respectively speaking, Chile 48, Brazil 67, and Mexico 63. So we see that um, Ecuador is the third highest rate in the region. The first cause of uh, girls between age 10 and 17 years of go, uh, o age going to the hospital is to give birth. So we have a lot of uh, uh, girls under 19 years of age giving birth. Be as of 2016, 74 women were put on trial for abortion in the country. That's just in the last two years for the first time in our history within this context. So I'd like to stop here just to tell you about a study of a percentage of these cases. During the first year that the new criminal code was in force, we studied the trials that had been started for the first time in our the history of our republic. There were 58 women, several of them under age 18, 14. Uh, were sentenced during the course of the study. This is the first time that this has occurred in Ecuador. You may wonder what changed in the criminal code. That's why I think it's relative. Nothing changed. The new criminal code changed nothing regarding what is uh, punishable in terms of interrupting a uh, pregnancy in Ecuador. What changed was the political discourse. So something which was not on in the forefront came to the forefront. The president threatened to uh, um, uh, resign if this was not enforced. There were three legislators, part of those who had raised the topic, and some of them accepted this uh, punishment. And they excused themselves from the legislature for a month, and they approved the criminal code with the exact same rule that had existed over the last 100 years. And those 58 first cases that we analyzed in each and every one of them, 100 percent of these cases, all of them um, the, whis the people who reported them were uh, physicians at public hospitals who called in the police to arrest poor women who had gone to the public health services to uh, who had uh, been involved in um, uh, botched abortions, which was the prim uh, primary cause of hospitalization uh, for poor women in the country. So if we're not talking about uh, that's what happens when women are not involved in public policy making and establishing legislation. So what is the cause? What is the barrier that is preventing women from exercising our reproductive and sexual rights in the Americas? I wish to offer an answer to this question. And I think that there is a very big issue ahead of us that's going to be very difficult to address. Culture, ideas, prejudices, roles, and the sexual division of labor, sexism, and misogyny uh, on the part of decision makers, uh, public servants, service providers, uh, prosecutors, these people also determine the health of women and their opportunity to live with dignity, to enjoy health and their rights. Because in the Americas, one of the central issues that is going to be so decisive for other social determinants of health has to do with pregnancy and childbirth. It has to do with the age of uh, people who uh, give birth and access to contraceptives and abortion and ability to make decisions, also the freedom with which such decisions are made. We, we have statistics on pregnant girls between 10 and 14 years of age, so we know that these are not just health decisions but matters of freedom. And this is linked to violence against women, which is also something that has been mentioned in this panel. 
I wish to place on this issue on the table because there is a reality that women in Latin America and all ages are experiencing in our region which does not compare to the reality that men face. So there are issues, there are things that happen to women that are not happening to men in Latin America. And this has nothing to do with money or um, a decision or the political presence of women. All these, all this data has improved in our country over the last decade, but this has to do with ideas that continue to underpin political decisions and day-to-day -day decisions made by uh, health service providers in the public and private services. So this is the report I have for you. We have a challenge to work on this in the coming months and years. We need to seriously address head-on this still a delicate issue, but there need to be some minimum standards so that our governments uh, must adhere to them. So this is a central issue that is going to be touched on in the drafting of the review and different ways of addressing social determinants of health uh, for both men and women in the Americas. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Assistant Director. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. Dr. Satcher. Dr. Satcher and human rights. You have been a champion of the cause for health equity among ethnic, racial, minority populations, especially within the United States of America. How do you see the Commission and the review best acknowledge progress toward eliminating health inequalities, both ethnic, racial determined health disparities, as well as socioeconomic determined health inequalities? How to better address policy-wise intersectionalities and potential interactions effects between multiple equity stratifiers and social determinants of health? What do you think are the core structural determinants of health disparities in ethnic and racial minorities, those that seem intractable and or refractory to current action that should be targeted and how to effectively achieve health equity? Please. Well, thank you, despite uh, the glowing introduction, which I appreciate, I realize that uh, I missed a lot by not being here yesterday, and I certainly appreciated listening to the other panel members today. I want to say just a word uh, about my life and experience in America, because I think it's, it's relevant to our global discussion and certainly uh, the, sustain the sustainable development goals. I grew up in, in, in Alabama during one of the worst periods of segregation and discrimination, and it had a direct effect in, on my own family. I grew up on a small farm, and uh, we didn't have access to health care, and I was a victim. I, I, I developed a whooping cough and pneumonia very early. The one black physician in Anniston, Alabama, finally agreed to come out to the farm to see me, and he was committed. He stayed all day, but when he left, he told my parents that they should not expect me to live. And I, I think it's interesting that even though this physician felt that way, he could not admit me to the hospital because of segregation. The hospital did not admit blacks. But that was sort of the beginning of my experience. Um, Obviously, I, I, I survived, um, and um, the one thing I wanted to do was to meet Dr. Jackson, who had spent so much time with me, and my parents promised me that for my sixth birthday, they were going to take me to town to meet Dr. Jackson. I was really excited. I never met him. He died at the age of 54 of a stroke. But by the time I was six, I was telling everybody that I was going to be a doctor, just like Dr. Jackson. I had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> uh, nobody in my family had graduated from high school. But I was as certain of that as I have been of anything in my life. Uh, and I won't go into the details of what it was like growing up in Alabama and, and trying to make that a reality. But I will take it to what I consider to be the second phase of my life, and that is uh, getting to Morehouse College during a period of major civil rights activity, 
period of Martin Luther King Jr., a group of us used to walk from the campus to Martin Luther King Jr.'s church when, he knew he, when we knew he was going to be in town to hear him preach. So I became involved in, in the student movement. I uh, was arrested five times, including going to prison one time, um, and uh, became a real admirer of Martin Luther King Jr. and that kind of leadership. But I also was determined to go to medical school, so I would take my book to jail with me. Um, then I, of course, managed to get to medical school and to do well in medical school and to get opportunities to lead in medicine. So when I look back at, at my life, I, I see three phases that are relevant to what we are dealing with here. One, a stage in which I was primarily a victim. And you could talk, talk about that all day, of course. Second phase, very important, was a phase of confrontation uh, in which with the leadership of people like Benjamin Mays and Martin Luther King Jr., I learned how to confront racism and to be a part of, uh, of dealing with it uh, on the streets and legally. We made a lot of progress. Uh, laws were changed. Uh, and I, be I began to feel really good about the ability to confront injustice and inequality. But when I left Morehouse, I realized that I had a responsibility to be a leader in medicine and not just to practice medicine. And that has sort of guided my whole life and career. Didn't plan for any positions, didn't seek any positions, but I think it was my commitment to providing leadership to make medicine and healthcare serve all people. Well, I was able to get into government, and not because I tried, but because I was fortunate in getting the attention of people like Bill and Hillary Clinton and being appointed director of the CDC and then Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health. And uh, in 2000, January 2000, uh, was able to really lead the release of Healthy People 2010, and that's our nation's health plan. Uh, each decade, beginning in the 80s, we release a plan for the next 10 years that started with Surgeon General Julie Richmond. So in January 2000, we released Healthy People 2010. And as many of you know, in that release of Healthy People 2010, for the first time, we as a nation made a commitment to the elimination of disparities in health. I do want to mention, however, there was, there was another goal in Healthy People 2010 that's sort of often forgotten. And that other goal was to improve not just the years of life that people live in this country, but the quality of those life. And I say that even though we're not talking a lot about um, aging, it is a major issue in this country in the sense that there are many families who, because of their responsibility for their older family members are having to quit careers, give up jobs, because they cannot afford the care of their parents or grandparents. Uh, I served on the Alzheimer's study group, and in 2010, we estimated that there were more than 15 million Americans involved in caregiving for older uh, family members, over 15 million. It, it has to be much more than that now. But I point that out because it is in a system that does not adequately support long-term care, the burden that's placed on the family produces major inequalities. Often the caregivers will die before the older persons that they're taking care of. And that's happening in America in a major way today. Um, so I, I think we've, we've got we've to keep, keep that in mind. Um, but trying to implement the goals of Healthy People 2010 has, has been, I think, not just for me, but for a lot of people, a major opportunity, but also a major challenge. Um, we've made some progress. If you saw the report that came out recently from the CDC, and I think it was carried in the New York Times, um, there has been a significant 
reduction in mortality rate for African Americans in this country since 1995. Um, so the mortality rate uh, has, has decreased. Uh, life expectancy has increased by 3.6, even for the black male, which is really at the bottom of most of our health statistics. However, during that time, life expectancy for whites has decreased somewhat, primarily because of drug addiction and suicide, which are, again, problems that started among African Americans. When cocaine came to this country in the 80s, it was distributed in black communities where there were black males, you know, who were hopeless in many ways, out of work. They became the agents of cocaine. And that was the beginning of the mass incarceration of black men in this country, which has risen from, I guess, 500,000 people in jail in this country to over 2 million. We have the largest rate of incarceration of any country. And the major victims of that have been black males. Well, the next phase, I, I will say, the opportunity to, after leaving government and getting a call from uh, so, uh, from Director General J.W. Lee to be a member of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, chaired by, uh, by Michael Marmot. Now, uh, you know that Michael is brilliant, and, and you know uh, about his leadership skills, but I think what's impressed me most about him has been his passion and his commitment. And I think it really was the basis for the kind of work that we did as a commission. But it sort of changes your whole perspective when you get to the point where you really begin to look at health more broadly, and you really see that the major factors in health outcomes are social determinants. It, it, it just opens a lot of doors. And if we are able to walk through those doors, we could really make some progress in reducing health inequalities, health inequalities. But it's not easy. Um, I was in Idaho yesterday uh, talking about uh, health inequalities and how we, how we manage to, to make progress. And I revisited the fact that uh, President Obama, of course, led uh, the development of um, the uh, accountable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, according to that act, of course, uh, we would have been able to dramatically reduce the uninsured. And in many ways, we have. But as you probably know, because of politics, there's a lot of division in terms of how that act has been imp implemented. There was not a single Republican who voted for the Affordable Care Act. And it had a lot to do with the politics surrounding President Obama and, fr frankly, I think, the, the issue of race in this country. Um, it was not just the vote that's been a problem. Even the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, uh, states like my state of Georgia have refused to expand Medicaid, even though uh, they could expand it and for every three to five dollars invested by the state, they would get 90 to 95 dollars from the federal government to do it. And yet the politics is heavy, and I realize that in some ways I may have a bias uh, in looking at why people do what they do. But the fact of the matter is it's a tremendous opportunity that we have to dramatically improve access to quality health care in this country but it is intimately tied up with the history of race and racism. Now, Dr. Kamara Jones, whom I think some of you know, is president of the uh, American Public Health Association, I think the largest public health association in the world. And Kamara, who was a fellow in the Satcher Health Leadership Institute um, before becoming president of the American Public Health Association, uh, has been a major uh, proponent of looking at racism. And I like the way she approaches it. She doesn't approach it by blaming individuals. She defines racism as a system. And I think sexism probably falls in the same category. 
It is a system of the way we look at people. It is to um, unfairly advantage some people and to unfairly disadvantage others based on history, based on appearance. And so her whole efforts are to get people in this country to really view racism as something that impacts all of us. It impacts the way African Americans think, the way they think about themselves, the way we think about each other. So it's not a, a finger pointing exercise, it's to, it is to say, as she says so well, we should all ask ourselves the question, how is racism operating here? And I think, you know, with the very uh, profound statement by Tracy Robinson, I, I think uh, that question is critical to achieving the sustainable development goals. We, we've got to all ask ourselves, how is sexism operating here? How is racism operating here? if we're gonna make real progress in overcoming it and achieving the sustainable development goals. Now I said yesterday, and it's something you have to continue to think about, I would like to see us get to the point where health and health care are viewed as political no-fly zones. That really we would approach health and health care and the social determinants of health as areas where we, regardless of party, we set goals and we work together to achieve them. In our country right now, politics is a major barrier to achieving health equality. And so we have a long ways to go, but I think um, that not only applies to the United States, but I think as we approach the sustainable development goals, we need to begin to ask that self, ourselves that question. Help in all policy, but also how in the world do we uh, remove the politics that often serves as barriers to achieving health equity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thatcher. Kira, no sabes cuánto te agradezco. Uh, you have no idea how I thank you for you to have allowed me to lead this panel with these experts and with the things that they have said today. Thank you. For me, it was an honor to chair this uh, panel with the knowledgeable people I have around me and ojalá de osmosis works and I can uh, be uh, wiser now. Uh, I'm going to point out some of the important ideas. One of the things that I point out from Paulo is this part of avoiding imperialism of health. And I believe that this is a critical part and if we don't know how to mm, think that everything has to be around health and we're going to lose a very important space and we're going to align the rest and look at health as something that we want to forcefully in include when health could be good for in order to reach other objectives and also how can we share with them the advantages and how we can share the work that we have to do. This part of social justice goes through fiscal uh, justice, and I think it's important, and it's one of the ideas that Paulo leaves with us. Dr. Heredia has spoken about how diagnosis and proposal for human resources is part, an important part of the health policies, but also how we can you know, do this about where the feminization of medicine have a positive impact from the day to day and to advance important in this uh, path. This area of looking at woman as an integral subject throughout her life and not just a reproductive subject during the reproductive age, uh, age is also an important message that she leaves with us and how we can consider both sides from the, the, the medical part of, of feminization and also to look at the woman in wholly and not only in the reproductive part which sometimes we concentrate on. The resource, the human resources part with Susie Robinson which was very eloquent in her posture. I believe here it is very important the right to have access to the conditions that uh, present a dignified life and this uh, Dignified life is what is uh, spend, stands out, as it was said in Spanish very clearly. The dignified life, how we can achieve it, how we can have 
people to have this type of life with all the human rights. And this definition that she gives, that from the legal point of view, definitions are made of human rights to facilitate the access to the social determinants. This in part is important to point out because this at the same time implies the difficulty of the judges when they legislate these uh, social determinants when they do not have the training or maybe the understanding from the social uh, aspect, but then they only uh, concentrate on the legal part, and this bridge has to be built to help them to understand the social part and the implications that it may have. The case presented by Dr. Dromo from Ecuador, I think, speaks for itself. How the cultural part, but also the machismo, very much embedded in the population is still a barrier for sexual rights of women. How we have to fight day to day, and we not, don't see it only in Ecuador, but in many of the countries of the region, how the f legal frameworks inhibit the access to sexual services that are the r human rights and reproductive rights in order to have a, a, um, a safe abortion and how to have a healthy sexuality without fear of being punished by an, an undesirable pregnancy or forced pregnancy due to uh, rape. This speaks perhaps uh, taking the issue to a discussion because this goes beyond the legal part. This deals with the personality and the rights that not all, that Dr. Robinson has expressed and how they are defined from a legal point of view, but the legal can be part can be a barrier to get to these rights. And then uh, the personal story by Dr. Ratchet speaks for itself and how these barriers exist within the daily to day life in the United States and in our countries in Latin America, but also how the resilience of a person can s overcome these barriers and get to what Dr. Sachel has a guy arrived to. Th to have a guide from Dr. Jackson has um, painted a path of where to go and was able to walk it and reach to where he is today. The way racism is described as a system and how people are viewed according to their appearance affects us all. This is a reality. Racism is not only because of the color of your skin. It's also from the appearance of many people and it's, it's from the, the way where they were born by an ethnic group of where they were born and this racism and discrimination is not only in, in the south or part of the U.S. in the movement of the civil rights, but also is seen every day in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is one of the biggest challenges we have in this region, and perhaps it's one of the main causes of inequities that we are living through. With this summary, I open the floor for a discussion that I hope will be very enriching. Who will be the first? If you come close to a mic, it would help. Thank you for the presentations. I am Araucho Castro. I'm a professor of public health for Latin America at the University of Tulane in New Orleans. And I liked very much everything that was said, and it is true that uh, social inequality and racism and other discriminatory forms are the big challenge in order to reach uh, equity and health in Latin America and the Caribbean. But there's one element that I wanted to add, and I am convinced that it requires that it must be discussed more often 
and this is racism and discrimination and sexism that occurs I inside the health establishments. Dr. from Ecuador explained very well on the issue of post um, um, birth situation. This is not something that is uh, random. This is within the establishments, uh, health establishments. These are people who are the poorest and they are usually um, the, uh, of um, ethnic minority and, and all and the women. These are the, all these factors come together and it's very important to understand that part of the worst results of in health that occur in indigenous um, uh, groups are things that also happen within the health establishment. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, we're putting ourselves in the context of the work of the commission. Let's say that what invites the presentations that were just made is to review the issue of when we are speaking about measuring inequities, how are we going to find things that can be, cannot be measured, that have to be valued? For instance, in, these, in this focus, and all that has to do with gender and what was just mentioned by Maria Paula is, let's say, very complex to bring it to quantities <coughs> when these are absolutely important facts and that <coughs> enough is for one to happen and for a policy to be made. So this is one of the first thoughts that I had. The other is, let's say, to see how these elements the, that the academy, academicians pr present uh, each one in their own way in the concrete reality, you can find them in one person, a woman, be it indigenous or Afro or poor. For the case of Colombia, he, he could be a victim of social violence. And let's say that she has, this human being has all of the things that are expressed as far as inequality and inequity, and they are the product of the determinants of um, health equity. So how are we going to work in the aggregation of this data to see it more uh, complete in this reality of the everyday life? That's another element. Another element in the terms of, of rights is that we need to work a bit more on the issue of collective rights, not only individual rights. When we talk about indigenous peoples or the Afro, uh, peoples or women or even of uh, workers, we have to talk about collective rights, not only individual rights, and to also see the human rights from collective rights point of view. That's another issue that I think is interesting to address. For now, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I came from Argentina, graduated as psychology 30 years ago in 83, and uh, as part of an international exchange program for social workers, youth leaders from all over the world. And I, I was placed to work in Philadelphia in an African-American um, program for children. So it was my first time, you know that Argentina is a very homogeneous country. It was my first time uh, meeting African Americans or people of color all together. And uh, I had to learn about 
racism, discrimination, uh, Martin Luther King, because you know, in my shelter life in, in uh, Argentina, particularly in terms time of the political repression, though were, those were not issues that were discussed at the university level. We had a different kind of focus in our psychological training. So it was uh, striking to me at that time to notice that a few years ago there had been a gang war because of the drugs and uh, that was the beginning of the 80s, as, as you mentioned. And uh, gradually, the, um, with social programs like the House of Omoja and activities uh, the, by the local government, that level of violence had decreased. So um, over the years, I noticed, I've been working, did my PhD at Temple, and I've been noticed kind of a, a slowdown with the Clinton administration and the um, increase of the economic possibilities of minorities, you know, there was a, a slowdown of the level of violence. I'm actively working in the trenches uh, in the Philadelphia community, both with adults and children. For the children, I do home visits, and for the adults, I treat them in the, in, uh, the program. And what I notice is that an incredible increase of the violence due to drugs. They, every day or every other day, I have a, a mother and aunt, a grandmother or a relative coming tell, to tell me that uh, one of the members, particularly a young member of the family, had been killed at Point Range. And, uh, you know, with all the distress that, that those mothers are causing. And another thing that I think is very, very striking to me, um, that I grew in a country where I was part of the process of indoctrination into uh, communism and um, with the idea of putting Peron, who was in Spain back in the government, I, as a, as, a young, uh, as a young person, w participated in that process. So what I'm witnessing at the moment, which is very concerning to me, is that there is a um, significant effort to go into the prisons and uh, convert, particularly the large amount of Af young African Americans that are in prison, into the Muslim religion. Uh, baptism is not any longer a religion that would provide a, sense, a strong sense of identity for that particular pocket of population. So when they go out of jail, they go home, and they are converting the women, and therefore the children, into the Muslim religion. It is very significant among African Americans, and so among uh, Latinos, particular Latinos from Puerto Rican and Dominican descent. So what I'm observing is a, a process of having our own rebellious Muslim American-born community that in the future, if we don't address that situation, the enemy is not going to be coming from the madrasas in the Arab countries, but are going to be in our own land a born American, educated here, that are rebelling ag against the inequality. So that's what I think is so important, this meeting and the conclusions and the meetings and the impact that we can have, not only in Latin America, but in our own home, here in Washington and Philadelphia and the Northeast region. Gracias. Dr. Sacha, would you like to comment? Well, thank you. No, I just wanted to say that I, I think many of the young men who end up in prison are in fact um, looking for hope. They're looking for something to give them hope for the future. And in the Muslim religion, it's not the only religion that they have latched on to. It depends on who is willing to spend the time. And I think a lot of good has come out of that. I mean, Malcolm X was converted in prison and, and I think came back and did a lot of good. He was basically nonviolent, but worked to give people hope in Harlem and other places. So I wouldn't blame the religion, and I know you didn't mean to do that, but 
I just think we have to be aware that, you know, there are several different religions that people um, have gone to prison with to give people hope, and people latch on to them. And we're fortunate in many, cases, in many cases that they do, because otherwise they come out of prison and they just return to the streets and drugs and what have you. So I just want to make sure that we don't overly burden the Muslim religion with the, the fact that um, people are ripe for conversion, and a lot of good has come out of that intervention. Thank you, Dr. Sacher. Dr. Romo, por favor. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I wanted to uh, respond to one of the questions that were made. Uh, because of trying to link the issues of this panel with the task of the report, I believe that what Jose brought to the table, the issue that these stories or data or cases can not be reflected in statistics, may not be reflected in statistics, like 64 women that are in, in the jail in Ecuador, perhaps uh, statistically they're not relevant to 18 women um, uh, jailed uh, because of, of um, abortions uh, uh, may not be relevant in statistics, but, some, but we n need to have more relevance. And this is why I think that we I'm going to emphasize something that was said, that to give a contribution on the qualitative of this uh, report is going to be a, a key of or expressing some of the re realities that are most sensitive in Latin America. This is something that is important, that some of these cases can become indicators of what happens in Latin America uh, with its characteristics of uh, barriers that uh, impede the uh, access to rights. And I would add something else. Just like these cases that uh, are alarming to what happens in Latin America, there are also some minimal stand minimum standards and some issues that have been resolved by our courts and human rights. And I think that just as we have these cases, we could speak about the case of Beatriz that was resolved by the commission with a cautionary measure, and we can say that in Latin America we have had a woman that was looking for authorization in order to interrupt her pregnancy because it was high risk and she had lupus, and it was all, she was almost arrested in a hospital in Latin America so that she would, ha would not uh, have uh, an abortion. And the regional agencies of human rights have mm, made uh, standards, uh, minimum standards of, com of um, compliance in other um, countries. And after looking at the report and gathering these specific cases of the symptoms, as well as the possible solutions to which we have, to which we have um, come from the focus of human rights in the region and the continent is going to be important. And I believe that several of these issues that are cross-cutting can be reflected and should be reflected in the report from this point of view. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dromo. We only have five minutes left. If anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, yes, I believe that we should not lose sight of the challenge of this commission is to see the issue of inequities and the origin, the real origin of these inequities and also uh, inequalities. Uh, uh, obviously, when, we, when there was work the, the, in this, with the social determinants of health, it gives us a big basis. I, work, I bring this up because it's not necessary. We have to be careful not to lose the path or to be overburdened with certain elements. The issue of um, giving or to see the issue of religion as an element that could be determinant is, is very serious because we can also, from that we can say that those states or governments or governors who are very Catholic uh, or, uh, and uh, allow abortion, uh, this is the reason. No, that's not the way it is. There are other elements that play and then therefore I respect the criteria of the person who um, spoke before, but I wanted to say that we should not lose our path, we should not lose our way. I think there's an issue that has to be addressed anyway, that is, what happens 
uh, where uh, that is happening today at the, amongst the young people and does not occur only in the United States but also in every country uh, where there's a great migration of, uh, of the of, uh, people because especially amongst the young because um, they are looking for a horizon or an objective society is not giving them horizons or objectives so they need to find something and um, this for this how do we intervene or what is the important element that makes it so that people are are disoriented and i think it's the media how, what role does the media play in order for people, not only the young people, but all people, can have a future or a standard of living that is sold through the media and through the market who can buy this or have a, a card in order to have credit and no matter what happens later? And, uh, and not consider what is um, below. So an issue that has to be incorporated in this discussion is the role of the media and, and how a, 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 this large disorientation exists in everything. So when there is um, punishment towards abortion, there are a lot of, uh, there's the, the media shows uh, uh, a lot of disgust because of abortion, and uh, this is uh, in a report, but this does not happen <coughs> when you see the data and you see the number of illegal abortions that there are because the illegal, the legal system does not allow it, so the risks occur. But so, I, this is, we should not lose sight of the issue that is structural, one and two, what are the other elements that have influenced so that the issue of inequities be go to go more in depth? And I think the media has to be incorporated in this discussion also. Thank you, Dr. Redi. I think that we need to stress the fact that while they are cross-cutting issues, they are also interrelated. And I see it as if these are the different threads in a very strong rope, uh, not just as parallel. If we look at them as parallel cross-cutting issues, they lose the strength that they can have if they are intertwined. I think we should keep this approach, and I hope that the Commission can keep that vision. If we just look at these issues separately, they will, we will not have as, as strong of a response as if we address them together. Everything is interrelated. Everything, all of these issues affect each other. And a comprehensive approach uh, strengthens our response. And if we address them separately, our response will be weak. So we should look at them as common threads in one strong rope. So, and now to wrap up, I'd like to say that the population of the Americas is sick and tired of injustice and impunity. And I go back to what you were saying, Dr. Heredia. The young people are looking for direction, and their fatigue may place many populations on the edge of a knife in a very delicate situation. And if governments do not put an end to this injustice and impunity, the young people are going to try to find another way to do it. So this is a very delicate matter that governments must address. Once again, I thank all of you for your participation, and I thank you for the opportunity and privilege of coordinating this panel, which has been exceptional. Thank you very much. It's lunchtime, and we'll be back here at 1 p.m. Thank you.